So, hello everyone. Um, thank you for being there. I am Antoine. I am with Mission Public and with our team that is here Yves, Benoit, Morgan, who is here, and Nadia, who is Nadia, and Pascal. There. Okay, so we welcome you today to this open forum. We are really proud and happy to have you here. Um, it's a project that we have been starting for two and a half to three years ago. And it was quite a bit, um, quite a, a crazy idea to bring citizens into internet governance. And when we mean citizens, we were meaning ordinary citizens. So people that have no idea and no knowledge on what is internet governance. But the idea in this bet that they also have a role to play in that story. So this is our bet, <laughs> and now we are very proud that part of it, uh, we won it. Um, we have been organizing uh, 12 preliminary discussions in 2018 in order to understand priorities and the agenda of citizens on the Internet. Um, and then in 2019, this year, we have been organizing workshops in five countries of the world with a deliberative process based on information, balance information materials, a deliberative meeting of randomly selected citizens, and the uh, gathering of results that we deliver back to policymakers this year and decision makers this year. So we are very happy that we have been doing this cycle, and we are more than happy that it is not over, and that we want uh, also today to launch next year, and next year we want to scale that process, to something like 100 countries, that's our ambition, um, and we want to have that in June next year. But for today, we are going to talk about the results of this phase of uh, dialogues and workshop, and we are going to talk about the results on disinformation and digital identity, but also on messages to IGF from the citizens. These were the topics that we addressed this year. You will see that, um, maybe now we can have the, the presentation, Okay, so um, this is our goal, bring citizens into policy. That's what we do at Mission Public. These are our strategic partners for this year. And here too, we are really proud of having uh, gathered a broad coalition of actors to prepare that process and run it. And these are our cooperation partner for this year. And we have our national partners in the countries where we had the preliminary discussions and the workshop. Um, during today, we are going to also have participation, because in a way we like <laughs> participation, we love it. Um, so we have a slide of running, and we will be asking you some of the questions we asked to the citizens during the session. So uh, each time you will see um, a slide going, um, and we will ask you a question, you will be able to answer it, um, and, and, and yepa, okay, later, later on. So first, we will give you a video impression of the work done this year, and the five workshops done in the countries. So now we can give you this insight. Die größte Herausforderung für mich ist eigentlich zu wissen, worum es geht mit dem Internet. Google, Facebook, WhatsApp, <lacht> Korruption, Memes, Darknet. Diesel for the world, that's in the hot on as on less than for the only. Imaya, Nigawari, Noyona, Monodes. Digitale Identität is the Fußabdruck or the Sachen, die man von sich persönlich im Internet hinterlässt. Ja, aber Kumpuga or Nabaga, Kuma Sokoya or Nani do Ahirao. Sekura, Kumipum is Nigay, my son, with the Nigay stuff, soil. 
ari nk'ahantu rwose bagenda nko gusaba ibintu kumva birarengere ukavuga ibi byose ni byiki für kriminelle Handlungen. Quando a gente fala, por exemplo, de fake news, são pessoas prejudicando outras. Que não tem muito conhecimento e acredita na primeira coisa que lê. Disinformation é ni taishite wa kyouiku ga ichiban juyo da to kanjimashita. O buryo na koresha kujira ngo ibyo ngibyo biveho abantu no gukangurira leta. Misata no yare to ka dile makushi a yevan chanti a yevan. Nango ibi. Ich habe gar keine Angst. Nun bei uko harumut sunge, isi zaba iyo borugana ba nuhitu mi changu kwa ba nuta. Da passieren Dinge, die sind ein bisschen außer Kontrolle. Und meus maiores desejos é que essa internet chegue para todo mundo. Wir gehen nur ab und mal den Tag selber. Und wir sollten gut zueinander sein. Para eles que vão discutir o futuro da internet, vai com cuidado. これからも他の世代の人とインターネットについて話す必要があるなと感じました。Thank you very much for the applause. Thank you, Nena, for launching the applause. <laughs> so we um, are going to. So when we say we work with ordinary citizens, let's look at the group. So in uh, the 300 participants that we had, we had a repartition of female 49 percent, male 51 uh, percent. So it's a very good gender balance for the participants. Um, thank you. <laughs> In terms of uh, um, age um, repartition, we also had participants from 17 to 82, and uh, that's also a very good uh, number for us, and the repartition was also quite good over all ages. When we look at profession and what people did, we had also very good repartition between uh, all uh, type of occupation, um, and um, for that also very good diversity. Um, then we also, when we do such deliberative processes, we like to understand the difference between when people enter the process and go out of the process. What did they learn during the day? Did they learn something? And how they change their opinion? And for that we have questions that we ask in the morning and afternoon. And here you can see, uh, we ask them in the morning and in the afternoon if they see internet as an opportunity more than a treat, uh, a threat or the contrary. And you see that between the day it, uh, you have a good shift to more an opportunity, which is quite interesting, knowing the fact that we, they talked the full day on big questions like disinformation, digital identity, and the challenges it brings. So it's a sign that people get confident by knowing more and more about the topic. Uh, and on the next one, we ask them about how well they know different topics, um, like disinformation. So you see morning, afternoon, it's a, a huge shift in knowledge, also on digital identity, uh, even more, even bigger, and on internet governance too. So here um, we see that people learned during the day and have a good, uh, have had a good uh, funded discussion on the topic. So now <laughs> we have a question that has, should have appeared on, uh, on Slido, and this is one of the questions we asked the citizens. Um, 
and um, you can join, join it and answer it, OF25. Um, now we'll turn to our national partners from uh, last year and this year, and I will first start with Arthur. Arthur, you were our partner in Uganda in 2018, and you uh, ran the preliminary discussion. I'd like to ask you, why did you decide to join as a national partner, and how was this experience? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we uh, decided to join as uh, national partners based on uh, an earlier meeting that my supervisor had with uh, Antoine. I think it was, must have been the IGF in uh, 2017 or thereabout. And really what, what, what came out for us was the, the misconception that very many people have about the internet. So when we reviewed the, the questions and the guiding principles behind which uh, Antoine achieved, wanted to achieve, it was something we really wanted to be part of, something we wanted to join. And it, it didn't disappoint because uh, the, the, the issues that we in Uganda consider the internet are not necessarily what is the internet. So it was an opportunity for us to try and clear the air uh, Again, like the results, the results you've seen, many people had misconceptions in the morning, but then by evening, uh, many of those had been cleared, and uh, we we'll look forward to doing this again next year. Thank you very much, Arthur. I turn to Peter. Peter, yes, Vint. Antoine, I just realized that that microphone doesn't come out on this headset, but all the other things seem to. I don't understand that, but. I'm not okay, sure. I would switch suggests. the microphone. It's well, I can I can manage with the transcript. I was just discovering that I was hoping that this would work both ways, but maybe it's not. for the team there. It uh, has nothing to do with that. When, if that microphone doesn't come out of the headsets, no microphone will. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Is it okay for you, Vint, to pull on the translation? That's not going to work, is that right? Well, then I'll just use the transcript mm -hmm. and, and hope that you are very clear so the transcriber gets it right. Yes, okay. I'll try to practice my accent. <laughs> Let's see if that works as a French. Um, Peter, you are the German partner of uh, yes. this year. Uh, same question, why did you join? And what happened? Who was this experience of joining the project? Yes, thank you to be here. Uh, me, I'm coming from Mannheim. It's in the southwest of Germany. Mannheim is a city with 320,000 inhabitants, and two of these inhabitants are also here in this room. Um, I say a very warm welcome to Elena Stübinger Janas, and a very warm welcome to Frank Michel from Mannheim. Um, it's uh, very interesting for us to make a cooperation um, and to work with you, with Mission Publique. Um, we, um, my, 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 uh, my job, I'm the head of the Office for Democracy and Strategy at the um, city of Mannheim, and I'm also responsible for the online communication of the municipality. And so we had three reasons and uh, three topics which were important to collaborate with um, Mission Publique. Uh, with you, Antoine. The first reason is we start um, actually in these days a huge relaunch of our digital uh, communication channels. Um, in this process, we are very open for the issues of the citizens and the civil society. We want to focus the requirements from our citizens so we have similar questions to the society as uh, Mission Publique. And perhaps we get interesting ideas also from this, from your process. The reason number two is we are responsible in Mannheim for the participation um, of political um, issues uh, for our citizens. Uh, we get in the last year some experiences in the random selection and invitation of our citizens for such processes and events. 
Um, this wanted, this want you, and you make this um, also here in your workshop, and so it's fitted together well in this moment. And the reason number three, it's a huge interest in Mannheim to cooperate with citizens uh, with an international contact and international impact. For example, our Lord Mayor took part at the global meeting of the Global Parliament of Mayors in uh, November. It was uh, two weeks ago in Durban, South Africa, and he was elected as chairman of the GPM, the Global Parliament of Mayors, and he is very interested in this collaboration and in the international level. Thank you, Peter. Vint, you wanted... It's, it's Vint. I just have to tell you a secret. My family is from Alsace, and one of the family names is Mannheimer. Ah, so, okay. So, wir sind alle Mannheimer. <laughs> ah, okay. Today, today we are... You are always welcome in Mannheim. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was last th week there, in Elsass, not... Thank you, Peter. Um, so now we are going to show some results um, on disinformation. So we are going to dive into the first topic, disinformation. And I will show you two um, key results. So one question we, we asked is how problematic is the pre spread of disinformation for you and for the world? And as you see, people in the five countries are, um, see that as quite problematic, uh, but for, and much more for the world than for themselves. So they have a kind of... Uh, a discrepancy between how they feel themselves um, with this information and how they have the impression that the rest of the world is exposed to that. Um, yes. Have there been differences between the countries? Because I assume this is amongst all the participants, but you, since you did it in different places. So yes, there is. In, in um, this case particularly, there is a north-south, uh, global-south difference. And of course, if you rank from the less... Um, uh, Although, well, if you rank from the less um, um, problematic to the most problematic, you would have uh, Germany, uh, then um, you would have uh, Rwanda, uh, Bangladesh and the Rohingya refugee camp, Brazil and Japan. And that's a funny fact because Japan, you could say not uh, north-south is not uh, really working, but this would be the ranking. On the second... Um, Big question we asked citizens to work on, and this was a qualitative work on a scenario. We asked them to rank and work on scenarios on how to tackle disinformation. And what they came with was first education. It was the highest ranked and um, very um, high ranked in comparison to the other one. So what for us that mean, and this is, you here have a, a quote from one of the citizens, is that people see w one of their responsibility as person is also to get educated and be active themselves. Um, second uh, ranked was fact-checking tools, um, be it algorithmic automatic tools or uh, tools uh, from journalists, for example, making fact-checking. So relying on third parties in order to tackle and spot disinformation. And the third one and the least uh, uh, important for citizens was uh, regulation, self-regulation by governments and companies, so that did not seem to gain the most interest from the citizens as a solution. Um, I would like our um, um, two person from the room to uh, react on that, and I turn now to Ced Cedric. Uh, Cedric Warholz, you are working at UNESCO, and UNESCO is working on freedom of expression, uh, on access to information, and also disinformation. You are heading the UNESCO section on ICT in education, science and culture. And how do you react to um, the first uh, the, the results on education, um, so where people say it's part of our responsibility? Is it enough for you to uh, to tackle this information through education, or is, is, this, is there more to that? Um, thank you so much, Antoine, for inviting UNESCO to join, and we are a strategic partner and fully supporting this. And I think you showed also in your slides how the participants and citizens are learning uh, throughout this exercise, but the numbers are quite, uh, quite staggering. 86% uh, find it uh, problematic. 39% uh, in the slide you said uh, showed a strong exposure to disinformation, and, and the first source of information here from these 
these uh, people were also uh, the internet. So there is a big problem. And of course, you will not be astonished uh, to hear from UNESCO that we, we are for a rights-based approach to tackle this information in a sustainable uh, way. And education, as many of the uh, citizens uh, said, is of course uh, first priority. Now, is it their responsibility only? We don't think so. Uh, we have in UNESCO a long-standing uh, program on information and media literacy, and we help uh, countries build that into their education curricula. Uh, we help uh, teachers being trained in pre- and in-service teacher education institutions uh, to, to teach uh, me, uh, media and information literacy too. We have MOOCs, we have, we're doing research too. So education is central, but it's not their only responsibility, I would say. Of course, fact-checking tools are important too. Self-regulation of the media, uh, of providers of news is important too, as they, as they said. And we heard here in many of the discussions at the Internet Governance Forum uh, that uh, some thought also that there needs perhaps also a change in the way internet leaders see their business models, which is sometimes uh, linked to that. Now for UNESCO, um, we are working on freedom of expression and we are also strengthening the capacity of journalists, which we have education uh, uh, journalist curricula, which we have been updating also with regards to disinformation, deep fakes and so on, and how to deal uh, and to, to check this. Now the, the fourth approach I would like to share is the one of internet universality and the Rome approach UNESCO is promoting. It is a human rights-based, open, accessible, and multi-stakeholder shaped internet. And we've, we offer indicators for that and help and assist um, countries in, in doing that. But we do also very concrete work um, because the M stands for a multi-stakeholder uh, shaped internet. Uh, and we are, for example, with the ITU uh, co-vice chairing the Broadband Commission uh, where we created a working group on disinformation. And we have Facebook, Twitter, and many of the key uh, leaders there. A and we, we will publish, uh, we have a specific working group on this, we'll publish new research and recommendations in this beginning of next year. Um, but we have also a very concrete uh, measures, and I will close with that, um, in terms of the judiciary. Um, we have, we're training uh, in Latin America alone, we have trained 13,000 judicial operators. So if we're speaking about same rights online uh, as offline, there is also a need uh, to, to, to address uh, that because there's more and more being brought to court. And I will have to excuse myself, I'll have to run off to a session with our, our chief justices, which is uh, later there. So UNESCO will continue to protect human rights around the world and develop sustainable ways to counter this information. Uh, and we are keen in doing so with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cedric. And head off to your next session when you have to. Thank you for having reacted to that um, question and that result and related to the work you are doing. You have a question. My name is Zerguna Jalal Zoya. I am from a regulatory body in Afghanistan. I am a board member of Afghanistan Telecom Regulatory Authority. I am looking at this information from a regulatory perspective. That uh, this information, of course, uh, especially in the uh, countries like the uh, developing countries, uh, raise more problem uh, because there is uh, no control on this one. And uh, I think from a regulated perspective, there should be law and some condition in the law, and there should be policy and uh, regulation for that one. Otherwise, uh, this information will uh, spread more and uh, affect on the people and the human. And uh, sometimes, uh, like, uh, if we cannot stop the uh, technology, when technology is improving, with, uh, when the internet access is improving, so this problem is also uh, raising. And uh, I think, uh, like there are uh, some countries did uh, the big data analysis and uh, to have the control on the Facebook or uh, some countries uh, stop uh, some of social media uh, to do not face to such an issue. But like uh, in China in uh, UAE, I saw that uh, they uh, brought some condition for some of uh, this one, like Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, and so you would uh, uh, yes. more be on the third category regulation and, and self-regulation if you, you would have to, to choose a way to tackle this information? Uh, yes, if there is a regulation and if there is some condition in the law or uh, some uh, policy steps, 
to the people should inform. This is uh, not a good way to use like a disinformation and spread the disinformation among the citizens and people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the reaction. I turn to Nena. I wanted to uh, um, ask you on the contract for the web. Um, so the contract for the web says it's a global plan for action to make our online world safe and empowering for everyone. So how does um, that um, reflect with um, the result uh, we have shown and the concerns and solutions that citizens put education and uh, the question of uh, regulation and the diff different. Does that work with the contract for the web? Do you have to change the contract for the web? Do you <laughs> or do citizens have to change to adopt the contract for the web? What is your reaction on that? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from the World Wide Web Foundation. We are happy to be part of this initiative uh, because the vision of Sir Tim Berners-Lee when he was putting together the protocol that gave us the World Wide Web is that everyone should be a creator and everyone should also benefit. So this is very important. Um, then Seth is here and he can speak more to the work they did building up what we call the internet today. It, is, it has always been in the spirit of collaboration, of co-creation, that everyone should be able to contribute and everyone should be able to benefit. Having said that, the issues we are raising in these dialogues are the very same issues that brought us to the contract for the web. If you want to look at what we do as the Web Foundation, we don't do contract. We do something else. There's a slight difference. We do three things. We mobilize coalitions to be sure we can have a safe and the web we want. We do research and we lead policy thoughts and changes. It is the, the, the sum of these three, working with all older partners that brought about the contract for the web. There are nine principles in the contract for the web. Three to governments, three to private, the, the industry, two for citizens and one for all of us. I want to come back to principle eight of the contract for the web. It enjoins citizens to use and create and to maintain civil discourse. In many places, we have seen people who know what their rights are. We have seen citizens who know what governments should do for them. We have seen people who know what they have a right to, but nobody's speaking about their own responsibilities. Who does hate speech? Who brings about misinformation? It's the users. So we all have rights, but we also have responsibilities. And that is the reason why we think that we should have more debates. We should have more discussion. No, we are not changing the contract. We are building it. Last year, we launched the principles. Two days ago, we launched the full contract. Now we are we're looking into the actions in the country. And this, we believe, is one of those actions. Let's have a face-to-face -face dialogue. Let's say what works and what doesn't work. Let's see who is doing what, what can be done. So it is very important that we work together with the internet and the World Wide Web, and in this case, the contract for the web, to make sure that as we are benefiting from the web, we balance responsibilities and rights. And I'm not talking about just government. There are things that government should do. There are things that industry should do. But I, when I log in, there are also my rights on one hand and my responsibilities. It is for everyone. It is because of everyone, it is with everyone, and we are all into it. And that's why it's one nation, one vision, one web, one internet. We are all here, and we all have a part to play. Thank you very much, Nina.
And indeed, we one of the exercises during the deliberation was on rights and responsibilities. Um, so we don't have the results here, but they are in the database, and we will exploit them also and, and have some vision and insights on, on what citizens think are responsibilities and rights. Um, I would like now to turn to the results of uh, the Slido, uh, because normally we have... OK, so <laughs> here we have okay only three participants, but 100% very problematic. So you are quite aligned, but uh, much more concerned than the citizens, the three of you. Um, and the next one, um, uh, how to tackle um, it, uh, disinformation. Here we have quite a um, difference because you, you see first education and then regulation, self-regulation, and not much about fact-checking. So you don't believe uh, much in fact-checking tools. That is interesting. Um, does someone want, want to react um, on, on that? Or Eve says me the, the clock is running, so we go. Ah, I, I was thinking with Eve, uh, okay, does someone want to comment um, or why they voted one of the, the choice? Um, ah, we, uh, it's changing now, okay, it's changing a bit. Uh, or why not fact-checking tools? Maybe that's the interesting question. Someone that answered. Okay. Okay, my, my question is a little bit about something that was just said a minute earlier about the disinformation, if I could pose a question or a comment about that. I'll be very brief. Okay. okay, very quickly. I'm a little concerned sometimes that combating disinformation uh, can have an unintended negative consequence. So some of the things that get labeled as disinformation can be dissent in society. And I can think of examples of that in my country, the United States, where a number of um, investigative reporters have found themselves unable, they've sort of lost their voice, they've, they've declared themselves excluded from the legacy media, so they've moved online, but online at times, in fact, they've been formally labeled as fake, in, fake news or, or disinformation, when in fact, I think there was good evidence that they were dissenting information. So I think we have to be very careful when we go after disinformation to not silence dissent in a society. Thank you very much. Um, the citizens had a very big discussion on uh, satire, uh, so the way um, um, sa uh, satirical uh, content, and uh, for them this was a big topic around disinformation. When it is disinformation, when is it satire, and how to handle uh, satire in relation to disinformation. That was a, for the citizens a very big uh, big topic. So yes, the the, the lines are been to be drawn, and I use this opportunity to tell you that we have with us the balanced information materials that we presented to the citizens, where all the, those definitions also are put into, so that we are sure that we have a common definitions of what we talk about when we talk with the citizens. So you can have the information material and, and see what we meant, meant when we meant disinformation in that dialogue. Vint, you wanted to say something. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to make, uh, I think, two or three observations. The first one is a counterfactual uh, piece of information with regard to education. What we have uh, found in the United States is that the fact that you have a good education does not necessarily prevent you from uh, receiving and propagating misinformation and disinformation. In fact, there's a uh, an indication that uh, more educated people are sometimes drawn into the disinformation loop. Um, we see this uh, in the U.S. with the right and the left wing uh, online and television media. So we should be careful not to jump to the conclusion that just because people are well educated, that's proof against uh, an ability to resist uh, misinformation and disinformation. Uh, the earlier comment about dissent also has another uh, phenomenon. If you repeatedly tell people X is not true, sometimes they remember the X part and they don't remember the not true part. And so we found by repeating a piece of disinformation and saying it's not true, we reinforce the disinformation. This, you talk, have to talk to psychologists about that. There was a fourth option than, uh, than the three that I see up there, and that's called critical thinking. And that goes together with fact-checking, except for the problem of figuring out what are the facts and what sources do I trust uh, for factual information to help me uh, 
uh, distinguish disinformation from good quality information. So even though we should be trained in critical thinking, I think everyone should feel that responsibility for thinking about what they're seeing and hearing. Uh, it turns out to be hard to apply if you don't have a good source of facts. So, thank you. And on that, indeed, citizens, so one of the subcategories of um, fact-checking was um, critical thinking, as you label it, in the sense that citizens said we have to learn how to spot uh, what is uh, uh, disinformation. So it was also part of the, the answer they, they gave. Um, thank you. We are now going over to digital identity, and I will present two results. Um, the first one is um, we ask citizens which kind of model they would uh, prefer for a digital identity. A um, model where they have one central identity, where they put everything. Um, a model where they have one identity for each use case, so for each account, each kind of uh, channel of communication they use. And in between, a couple of identities with, for example, one identity for health uh, questions, one identity for everything that has to do with communication, and one for finances, for example. So this was the three model we asked them to reflect on. And what we saw is that the one with a couple of identities won, uh, uh, in a way, and um, the, the number here, the 40%, may not be the highest majority, but when we looked at the arguments why they, cho they chose uh, that one, is indeed, and what we see is because they were saying the trade-off, is really between usability and security. So for them, having one um, for each uh, use case is a good trade-off between uh, having all in one place and having a risk of being hacked, and the one where you have to, for each and any service, each and any use, you have to create, have a new identity. So that was the reasoning uh, behind what uh, th this number says. The second um, question we asked was about uh, who should decide, so the question of governance of digital identity. And for that, we asked them to um, fill in a table with the different actors uh, we know here, so um, the different categories of stakeholders, and um, the level of power they should have on the process of deciding how to govern digital identity. And what you see here are the quotes from one group, so it's one table um, from um, Rwanda. And uh, this table uh, gave their arguments why they think those groups of people should have uh, this role. And so, you, as you see, it's a, it's a kind of a representative of the kind of arguments you, ha you have at those tables during the deliberation. Um, and the model which came first was co-deciding, uh, meaning something more than multi-stakeholder. Citizens had a preference for every actor having a voice and um, the system having to find a consensus uh, for a solution. But as a fallback solution, when we um, saw the data, that what could be if this doesn't work, there, there seems to be a good preference for governments uh, and a private sector to decide on digital identity. So the, fallback, the first solution, co-deciding, fallback solution, governments and companies. Uh, so that's uh, how citizens uh, uh, saw the governance of digital information. Um, I turn now to Cheren. Cheren, you're here. And I wanted to ask you to react um, to that result, um, knowing that your work at ISOC has one part on digital identity uh, and also a big focus on encryption. Uh, how do you see those results for your work, your strategy, and how does that uh, relate to that? Yeah. Thank you, Antoine. It's our great pleasure to be supporting your project, which we, re we will, I hope, we will continue to work together next year as well. Encryption, as you said, is a big part of managing, governing our digital, potentially multiple online identities, and it's a very important tool. We talked about opportunities and threats. They both coexist in the internet world. But encryption is a very important tool to make sure that we, the benefits, the opportunities outweigh the threats. Securing our communications is not a high-tech thing. It's like if you look at Sumerian ancient tablets, people still try to have some sort of private communications and encryption, even if you're dealing with government, e-government services, digital health, banking, finance, or while simply chatting with friends, we rely on encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, in our everyday life. So it's not just a technical buzzword which is incomprehensible for 
mere mortals and everyday citizens. So that's why your work is very important for humanizing the narrative. Uh, because we need to raise awareness, there is a global trend uh, for mostly law enforcement purposes, which are legitimate purposes too, for crime prevention, uh, for access to information when it's necessary to prevent crimes or for uh, when you have court decisions and everything. There is a global trend uh, to weaken encryption or to access encrypted information through either encryption backdoors or other uh, initiatives like middleman uh, provisions or like the goals proposal in the UK, I don't want to point fingers, it's, it's really a global trend. So we need to raise awareness both in policymakers and also in the community uh, because as you're trying to, if you take encryption backdoors for example, uh, if you have encryption backdoors and weaken the encryption, the bad actors will also try to use and potentially succeed in accessing that information. So as we're trying to provide security, we're also compromising security of individuals, privacy of individuals, because constantly we still have this false dichotomy of privacy versus security. Uh, and actually they can coexist and they have to coexist. Privacy and security cannot be isolated from each other if we're talking about securing our online communications. So this is very, very important in our work. And also we have this security versus security argument now. And we, need, we really need to humanize this dialogue. And uh, while governments or policymakers have legitimate interests in accessing some certain information, exceptional access might not be the best idea, as you can compromise network security. And also for especially, again, a very human problem for vulnerable communities, vulnerable groups like uh, indigenous communities, LGBTQ plus community. So they also rely on encryption in order not to be discriminated. So these are very human problems. Although it sounds technical for most people, humanizing the narrative around encryption is a huge part of the work that we all should do. We're all responsible for, so I salute you for your, your work on this and hope to uh, work together more in the following years. Thank you. There is indeed one reason, one question we asked um, to the, the groups was um, how would you place the cursor between anonymity and transparency on the internet? And uh, the citizens worked so well that they crossed both and they gave the arguments why. So now we have to extract that qualitative data. So we have, don't have the quantitative one, but we know that they talked about that. And I'm yeah. also looking forward what they said for them what was speaking for the one or another, and if they have a preference I, for... I can have just one. The, when you're talking to people, uh, again, coming from the privacy versus security, the I have nothing to hide argument is still very strong. And but for starters, privacy is not about hiding information. It's about empowering people, whether or not to decide sharing information. So I have nothing to hide argument fails every time. There are several ways to address that, I usually ask for their banking uh, password or some other very private information and then they start to think. So it's again a matter of uh, sending out the message on that too. Thank you. Um, I now turn to your neighbor, um, Rudolf. Um, so you have been running the week, the entire week, and still you are here. So I thank you for that. Um, and thank you for the organization. I uh, take the opportunity and the support. We are the first partner on board. So thank you for that. So now um, you believe from the beginning that including citizens in that discussion is something very important. And I remember our discussion in Geneva on that. And you said we will be on board. So I uh, remember that very well. So now you've been um, working at the core of the IGF process. Is it still a, a good idea? Or how do you relate that to the week that you have been um, experiencing until now? Yeah, thank you, Antoine, and um, congratulations for, for the really good uh, work and achievements. And of course, we think it is still important because one of the aims that we set ourselves um, as a humble host country and uh, knowing that this is a bottom-up process and so forth, um, still we wanted to enlarge the scope of the debate by various uh, means, involving parliamentarians, involving SMEs, uh, but also uh, by involving... Um, this um, what you call ordinary citizens. So the people that are not 
in a usual in a in a daily day to day context confronted with uh, all these um, internet governance discussions that we are having here, but uh, who are of course exposed to the results of what we are discussing here. And I think that's uh, really crucial. And you you can of course argue that um, the citizens' um, opinion is also somehow represented by the parliamentarians, by the governments, because if they are democratically elected, they somehow reflect what is going on. But still, I think in, in such a um, complex and uh, fast-changing world, it is uh, crucial to have a direct feedback also to this community uh, uh, from, from the citizens. So uh, really, I think um, this kind of um, involvement of the citizens should be, should be continued and should be, uh, and should be enlarged. And we, and we very much actually welcome the uh, diversity of, of, of the citizens that you involve. As you said, gender diversity, regional diversity, stakeholder diversity, that's so important. So it, it gives not every single voice, but altogether it gives a really nice picture of a mosaic uh, that comes out of these small pieces, a very nice picture, and, and we should definitely try to uh, uh, keep this alive. Thank you very much, Rudolf. I now turn, yes, one reaction here. Sorry, I don't know if I have permission to ask a question or no, <laughs> but uh, how about uh, I have a question from uh, Ms. Uh, that uh, she said about the privacy of data of individual and there should be encryption. Uh, but uh, when we encrypt the data or decrypt uh, again the data, there will be some cost on the data. So this cost will be uh, suffer customer or it, uh, it will be paid by the, uh, the responsible uh, service provider. Uh, I don't know who will be uh, paid for this, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, cost of this uh, encryption of the information. Do you want to, to answer to that, or is it a discussion for after the, the, the from, I don't know, on the cost? Maybe you, yeah. Well, obviously, there are several business models for that, but ideally, uh, we support having default end-to-end -to -end encryption and a strong one. Uh, provided to the end user, so the burden should not be on the end user financially in the ideal situation. But of course, it's, we are hearing some concerns coming from uh, service providers too, but it's the ideal is every end user should have the uh, opportunity to have very strong end-to-end -end encryption by default. Thank you. Um, I now turn to Vint. Um, Vint, you were member of the high-level panel on digital cooperation. Um, and we have seen in the governance part of digital identity that citizens wish a co-decide model. Is this something for IGF Plus uh, and that track? Or is it not realistic? What is your take on this wish of citizens to have a model where we have more than multi-stakeholder? So uh, this is a really big topic, so I'm going to try to uh, pick a few bits of it. Uh, with regard to the uh, high-level panel, uh, what we were looking for is digital cooperation across international boundaries. And with regard to identity, let me pose for you one of the more important benefits of having strong authentication. If you have the ability to assert that this is me and I signed this document or I made this statement, then you defend yourself against someone else trying to claim to be you and trying to do something which is effectively disinformation. Uh, so strong authentication is your friend here. This is not an argument that says everything you do has to be strongly authenticated. It's an argument for having the tool available when you need it and want it. You can easily imagine having different levels of strength in the ability to strongly authenticate. In the case of a contract, for example, which takes place either domestically or internationally, you might want very, very strong evidence associated with the cryptographic credential so that it would be hard for someone to engage in a contract that draws you into uh, a commitment that you didn't make. On the other hand, you could imagine very lightweight kinds of authentication where um, the amount of information associated with the identity is limited to you're an adult or you're not an adult or you live in a particular 
a locale or, or a, a different one without giving all of the other details of your um, identity. So this leads me to, uh, this, I don't want to misrepresent this, my personal view derived from having participated uh, in this high-level panel is that there would be good reason to have more than one available identity uh, for different purposes, so purpose-built identities instead of a single one. Because if you have only one and if somehow it's penetrated, then uh, everything, is, all bets are off. However, I have to tell you as an engineer that there's this little uh, technical problem. At Google, we make very heavy use of strong authentication. We use two-factor authentication. We have a physical device that has the cryptographic keys in it. And it, we register those devices so that we can't even get into our own systems uh, without using the two-factor authentication. So I feel really good about that. And then I think I have about 300 different accounts scattered around the internet for different purposes. If I had to have a separate physical cryptographic key for each one, I'd have a big bag. I'd probably be more healthy, but I'd have a big bag full of 300 of these things and I would be fumbling around trying to figure out which one to use. This is an opportunity for somebody to build a product that has the ability to hold hundreds of cryptographic credentials so you could use the same thing, calling on the appropriate ones, which also suggests standards, which also suggests digital cooperation across boundaries to establish standards, not only for the technical side of things, but for the bona fides that you present in order to authenticate before you get your credential. So this, I hope, turns out to be a really rich opportunity a very concrete thing that we could do in the digital cooperation space in the, from the uh, IGF Plus uh, perspective, we should be bringing as many use cases as we can to the attention of people who could develop these products and services so that they do something that turns out to be actually useful and usable. Could, could I ask a completely unrelated question just to get it on the table? Yes. The data that we just saw from uh, the um, exercise of this uh, program showed a significant shift in attitude from morning to afternoon. It's really important that the reasons that led to the shift be exposed to the rest of the population. So a very important question is how are you going to get that learning into the hands of the rest of the population and not the 75 people that happened to be in this room in Tokyo at the time? That's, you don't need to answer the question now. I just want you to know that's really important. Yes, it is, and, and indeed. So one way we like to do that is to work with our national partners so that can also use the results in the countries to raise awareness. And of course, if we start dreaming, we could have uh, such uh, dialogues in thousands of places every year, and then we would have enough people uh, that would uh, learn that. But it's maybe uh, in the coming years we have to build that. Um, Max, you wanted to say something. Yes, hello, my name is Max Senges. I also work uh, for Google, and I had the pleasure to work with Antoine and his team as a, um, in the academic advisory board, and uh, hence have a fairly good understanding. Um, congratulations that uh, you um, got to this point. Really awesome. Um, a couple of points uh, building on um, what Vin said. I agree that use cases are a very, very good thing to consider as we are um, discussing governance points. However, um, I do not speak for Google, but I personally would strongly disagree that um, uh, there is a, a co-voting model that involves citizens. I think the multi-stakeholder governance model is uh, uh, quite um, evolved at this point, and there are different roles for different stakeholders. And um, <coughs> it's, it's a misunderstanding that um, the governance actually happens here, right? We are exchanging, we are deliberating, we're thinking about solutions, and then ev every stakeholder goes back. You know, the companies are not involved in the lawmaking, um, the um, 
the governments are not involved in the product making and the coding, and um, hence the you know I think everybody has their their role and the idea to bring parliamentarians here as representatives of the people I think is really really good and a big step forward. We have 120 parliamentarians participate this year, and I think the participation by NGOs that really bring expertise and can be efficiency watchdogs and human rights watchdogs and contribute to the conversation is really good. Um, allow me to uh, add to Vin's points about the, the benefits and, and um, the, the qualities of this exercise. I think uh, to understand the reasons for the shifts in opinion is really the strength of uh, this exercise, to actually understand also how we can come together. So the, the qualitative analysis, but also the delta between the morning and the afternoon is really, really uh, important. Because basically what that shows you is um, that you can argue that a normal user um, um, questionnaire will not get you the right results. If you just went out and you, uh, you did a direct democracy exercise and you asked people, do you want that or that? And you know that changes really significantly after a, a thorough deliberation of the pros and cons, then probably we should not go out and um, ask people on the street about it. Very importantly, uh, I don't know if you've mentioned this before, if you did, apologies. Um, the balanced briefing materials are a very, very valuable resource for this community because they are peer reviewed and they list uh, not only the, the challenge itself and the topic itself, but the different options that are on the table for how to solve it. And um, not only that these are listed, they all even include the pros and cons and explain um, what's good and what's bad. We, in this case, we have put the balanced briefing materials at least for the better part of um, the exercise on the IGF wiki, which you can find at intgovwiki.org. And um, I hope we continue to evolve them and update them as a resource for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Max, and thank you for the coordination and collaboration. André, um, you wanted to say something, and then I give the word to Elena. Thank you. My name is André Sherbosh. I'm <coughs> national partner of the Global Debates in Russia, representing National Research University Higher School of Economics. And I'd like to have a proposal just to start a discussion. Uh, I have formulated this proposal. Maybe it is possible to, to create ne next stage of debates where, uh, which will be focused not within single country, but uh, on international uh, with representatives of different countries and stakeholder groups. I think this format of debates will also be useful. Yes, thank you, Andre. We talked about that this morning. I think it's one of the next steps of uh, citizen deliberation with uh, huge challenges on multilingualism. Uh, but I think you're right, and, and this is something we would like to test also next year and also talk with other partners about that. So thank you for the recommendation to, to do that and happy to work with you on that. Now I turn to Elena. Um, and you are here, you participated in the um, dialogue in Mannheim, and you are bringing with you a message uh, to decision makers that you've been uh, producing in the different workshops, and I'd like to hear you on that. We collected different statements in the workshop, and I had to choose one. And the one that I chose was, uh, that I chose now was, we wish that in all schools, children acquire basic knowledge about the internet, about software, hardware, and the processes around it, so that one can become an aware and responsible internet user. And the reason why I chose that statement was because while being at this conference now, I, um, I was surprised and also shocked about how many of the words and terms used I still don't know. And that's, yeah. And we had a lot of discussions um, in the workshop about disinformation, internet security, um, data misuse, and what we're talking and discussing about now as well. And um, I think to be able to handle those risks and to tackle down the mistrust that we have um, as citizens about those things, because we are always hearing about those things and have a certain mistrust of, against the internet because of that. Um, we just need to know to need to know more about it. So to need to more about the processes behind it, about how internet really works, 
and then we can really um, and then we can start to use the, to make profit of it and to use the internet in its best way. Yes, and for me, the best way or the first way to start to get the, the information is in, at school because there we can, from early on, on, learn, get the necessary information. So that we as citizens are as well able um, to participate and to be as, um, able to be asked when you ask me in the street, I could give you the answer then. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, I have two contributions left here and here, but before that, I would like to hear Frank, who is a second uh, citizen uh, that participated also in, in Mannheim in Germany and also has a second message. And uh, then I will take two more contributions and then we will close the session. Okay. Uh, the, the message is missing. Oh. It's just you. There we go. Oh. Okay, uh, we had a lot of uh, topics, isn't it? And we have to choose one out of them, and that's what I have chosen so far. We think that a secure key and the protection of our personal data must be examined as a priority at the International Governance Forum. The acceptation of internet applications that need and will need a digital identity depends on it. That is, the citizens, so all of us, yeah. have a right of transparency. At the end, it's the question, who is the owner of the data, isn't it? Who can create data, who can change data, who can manipulate data, and who can delete data? And the last point is a very important point. I also have the right that maybe some data that are wrong or I don't any longer that are the data in the internet, I want that they are deleted in a concrete, in a secure way. And I guess with the new wave of technology, the artificial intelligence, some companies or some states, governments, uh, can create new data that I never put in the system, that are data behind all, that are the beta in the background, using for control, using for manipulation, can use for new business models, but that are related to my identity. I never have seen it. And the most important point from my, from my uh, perspective is to have a transparency. This is the most thing that I'm missing. At the moment, I have no transparency. I can look in, let me say, what I created as data in the different software systems, in the different applications that I can do. But what is behind, I don't have any clue what's going on there. And that's the point here, we need rules. We need rules worldwide because the data centers, the applications are running worldwide. They are running not in Germany, to be really honest. So we need, let me say, uh, international regulation, international catalog, what is going on, what can be used, what not. And especially for the deletion of data, this should be also an agreement on an international base. That's very important from my side. Thank you very much, Frank. This um, point on, on data was a big discussion all over the world, so that's very important. I wanted to, do you want, uh, you had one question and then I turn to you, Vint. Well, it's not exactly a question, but a comment, but I will be very concise. Um, first off, I would like to thank you as an organizer, because contrary to many of the sessions that I've been here at the IGF, this is very straightforward and easy to understand. And this goes uh, to an important point that I would like to make, because I'm here uh, representing the Council of Europe, but also representing an ordinary citizen. And when I think of the debate that we're having here um, at the Internet Governance Forum, I think we're oftentimes very technical. We use very difficult words that are not very accessible to a lot of the population. And I think it's just important to remind ourselves that each and every one here of us here is also a user and what we're deciding about is essentially the future or well we're not deciding but what we are talking about is the future of the users so um, just as you said uh, earlier education is very important but what is also very important is that the topics that we're talking about they become accessible to the ordinary citizen in this world who are affected by what we're talking about um, so that they also are empowered, that they can bring in their own views, that they are empowered to decide on their own what is important to them and what is not. So in terms of developing this format, I would actually be highly 
um, in favor of developing a format where ordinary citizens are much more involved in a structure of an IGF in this dialogue on internet governance. Um, and just to make a last point, in the Council of Europe, the youth department, we use a co-management system where we as representatives of youth organizations work together with representatives of governments to formulate policy. And this exactly forces us to not talk in a technical policy language, but to be able to break down what we're discussing to something that's accessible and easy to understand for the average young citizen um, we are talking about in Europe. And I think that's very important. And for that reason, I would like to call upon a more easily accessible dialogue. And thank you very much for your contribution. I think it's very valuable. Thank you very much for your comment. Vint, I give you the floor, and then I will close the session. Thank you very much. Sorry, I have to switch back and forth because of the microphone problem. Um, two comments. First of all, with regard to um, this question of understanding how does the internet work, um, it's a pretty big, complex system. Do you know, before we allow children to drive cars in the United States, they have to take a course called a driver's training course. Maybe we should have an internet driver's license where you have to pass an exam that says you understand enough about the internet so that you can feel like you're, you know how to navigate this complex environment safely. So it's only tongue in cheek. I really think something like an internet driver's license would be a great course to have uh, in school. The second point has to do with what my friend Frank had to say. Uh, there's a very interesting problem in the internet and that is information about you ends up on the network coming from other sources than you. In particular, it comes from your friends and your family and your colleagues and people that you don't know. Uh, I don't know how many billions of photographs go up on the net into the social media. Sometimes they're pictures that were taken of someone else, but you were caught in the picture. Uh, I don't know how to cope with the fact that there's a lot of stuff about each of us that shows up in places we never go in the net, would not know even how to search for. And in a way, if you really wanted, let's take pictures for example, if you wanted to discover where every picture of you is in the net, the only way that would work would be if we used really good facial recognition. And some of us run away screaming when we think about that possibility. So this is an almost unsolvable problem to figure out how to track down and be aware of information about you and your business that you didn't put into the system, but somebody else did, even inadvertently. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for all the contribution and for being there uh, this afternoon. Um, we are um, now starting the next phase, <laughs> and that's 2020. We want to scale the process. Uh, we would like to invite you um, to be part of that, and Morgan, you can uh, show the last slide. It's on it. Okay, perfect. So you can become a partner of us and, and be partner in a country, be partner at strategic le uh, level. We would be very glad to have you. We have some copies of the information material you were mentioning, Max, here as a, as a paper. So if you want to take one, you will find them there. And you can also talk to Benoit if uh, you want to, uh, to discuss further, or to me or anyone. I really, really thank you and um, for having contributed to that and for being part of this project. Thank you very much.